Well, it it uh, is really a pleasure for me not only to introduce Chris Pedersen to those who do not know him yet. And if you do not know him yet, you must be a, a new visitor to our site. But Chris Pedersen joined our foundation in 2016. And boy, has he put his fingerprint on the work that we do. Uh, he has uh, been responsible uh, for creating the best-in-class ETF recommendations, uh, and uh, he has been responsible for helping us move uh, into the 21st century with our not only our 10 fund strategy that that we, he was here when he uh, joined the organization, but he has helped us create two and four and five and three fund strategies to make the process of investing easier uh, for do-it-yourself investors. But probably the thing that he will be remembered forever for uh, is, uh, is, is not only a, a book that he wrote, uh, but a strategy that he designed to help people combine two of the finest funds in the industry. One is a target date fund, and the other is a small cap value fund. And the book and the strategy are entitled Two Funds for Life. This is, uh, I think, an amazing piece of work that you've done, Chris. And uh, uh, we did earlier this year, uh, right? The first of the year, we did a uh, a piece that we'll have a link to for people who want to kind of take it from the very start. Uh, but uh, today we've got something I think very special because not in the book, right? Is this in the book what we're going to talk about today? No. No, this is new. This Brand is new. new and, and I wish I'd known it when I wrote the book. Well, that, that it, they're, they're going to learn about it today. So uh, let me introduce uh, happily, proudly, and forever thankfully for uh, Chris Pedersen and all that he has done uh, for the people who follow our work. Chris, take it away with this new table. I think it's a doozy. Well, uh, thanks, Paul. Thanks for that very gracious introduction. And as is always the case, uh, I can't take full credit for this. You know, it's any anything uh, really worthwhile and long lasting is usually the product of teamwork. And you, me, and Daryl talked a lot about this in its formulation. Uh, to, you know, as you described it, two funds for life really is pretty simple. It's the idea that uh, if you start with a target date fund, um, first of all, that's not a bad solution. It's a prudent solution. And I, I think a lot of people, if that's all they do for their whole life and they save 10, 15, 20% across that lifetime, will have a very secure retirement when combined with Social Security. Uh, in fact, uh, if I do that kind of a lifetime modeling, adding in a company match, you get to about doubling somebody's real inflation adjusted lifetime purchasing power. So just the target date fund on its own is kind of amazing. But what we wanted to do with two funds for life is figure out ways to take advantage of this academically developed information that you can be more diversified by adding a disproportionate amount of small in value. Um, you can be more different, more, more diversified. You can get a better return. You can get a better return per unit of risk. And you can actually have a higher safe withdrawal rate in retirement because of that. And so when I wrote the book, I, I did it from the perspective of a lifetime investor. You know, what would happen if you use these different approaches with all of the money coming in and going out across a lifetime. And what I learned after writing the book is that uh, very few people reading the book are 25 year olds starting out and, and facing that lifetime decision. A lot of them are in their forties or they're in their fifties or, or they're already retired. And one of the challenges then is how do you communicate to them how these strategies might work? because uh, their situation's all different. And the aha that led to this table is that 
when you combine small cap value with a target date fund, at any point in time along the target date funds pass, you just have a fixed allocation. It's just a portfolio. Yes, it will change over time, but we can take that portfolio and analyze it from the perspective of a lump sum investor and, and say, how would, it, how would it have done in the past? And in many respects, that's kind of an apples to apples comparison to the analysis we have of the other portfolios, the ultimate buy and hold, the US four fund, the worldwide four fund. And I think that's a really useful piece of information. And so that led to the creation of this table. And um, for those on the, on the podcast, I'll try and describe it and we'll keep it simple so that they can follow along. But I would encourage everyone to take a look at the table. Uh, it will be linked in the show notes, I'm sure. And uh, we'll start out at the top. So this chart, uh, what it does is it looks for the various time horizons that a target date fund typically changes its allocation. It looks at at a uh, an approximation of what the assets inside that target date fund would be. And so 25 years or more before retirement, uh, you're usually 90% in equities with a little bit of a tilt towards US uh, and a little bit less international on the equities and 10% in bonds. At 20 years before retirement, they start to ramp that uh, the equities down. And so you're up to about 18% in, in bonds. By the time you get to 15 years before retirement, you're 75% in equities, 25% in bonds. By 10 years before retirement, it's uh, 33% in bonds. At five years before retirement, you're in a 60-40. At retirement, you're a 50-50. And seven years after retirement, so they keep ramping those bonds down, even after or even ramping the bonds up. As you go into retirement, you're actually at a 30% equity, 70% bonds. So uh, that's how we modeled it. It's based off of the Vanguard allocation, and it's based off this idea that your risk capacity and your risk tolerance probably decline with time. For most people, that's going to be true. Not for all. For, for some people, it may even go up with time. But for the vast majority of us, as we get older, we have fewer years to work and fewer years for compounding to work for us. So we want to be more conservative. And right around that time of retirement, we're also getting a little nervous. Um, at least that was my experience. Even though I think we had oversaved, you get nervous. It's like, I'm not going to have these paychecks. Where's the money coming from? And so it's nice to have that risk reduction there. And so let me what just I, throw in a, yeah, a go ahead, Paul. question, Chris, because so uh, I'm 50 50 in stocks and bonds, and, and I'm 80 years old. So that says that uh, as somebody with that feeling about the right combination, they could be in a 2025 target date fund for life. They could just stay in that and they would have a 50-50 strategy, correct? Absolutely. And, and in fact, people sometimes do this. They will look at the target date fund and say, it's more conservative than I want to be. And so I'm going to choose a date that's farther out in time than my actual retirement. And if a retiree wanted to live in that box, as you just described it, what they would do is today they would buy into the, the uh, 2025 target date fund. And sometime in the next several years, they'd switch to the 2030. And then some years later to the 2035. You can essentially, you don't really live in the box because it's adjusting the allocation continuously over time, but you can get approximate it by, uh, by just kind of shifting every once in a while. Um, so yeah, you, it, the target date funds are generally conservative. I would say they err on the side of being a little bit towards the, the nervous Nelly end of the spectrum. And that's probably appropriate because the average person investing in a target date fund isn't going to be a student of personal finance. They're not going to uh, study uh, all of the things that we hope our listeners are going to study. They're going to be 
more likely to panic sell, less likely to ride out a downturn in the market. So I, I think it's appropriate and it's prudent, but it does suggest that for people who are going to be students of personal finance, who might be over savers, that they could take a little more risk. Right. So um, the next question then when I created this chart is, well, how can we compare these allocations that people are going to have choices of? And uh, what I decided to do was to analyze the nominal CAGR, the nominal historical CAGR. So that includes inflation um, and also show the worst 10 years that people might have seen a CAGR. And I did the back testing for that back to 1970 because that's where we have all these asset class good histories going back to. Um, I also highlighted the worst drawdowns that somebody might have experienced. And then I added a 30 year safe withdrawal rate uh, because I think that's important, especially for retirees. But for that analysis to be meaningful, I had to go back to 1928 and use some substitution asset classes that, that we've modeled and have used in a number of our studies. And so if we look at how a target date fund for a young person, 25 years or more before retirement would perform on those metrics, it had historically a 9.8% nominal return. That's the compound annual growth rate, almost 10. The worst decade was 1.1%. And uh, its worst drawdown uh, was 48%. So almost that factor of two that you say, if you're going to invest in the stock market, you got to be willing to lose half your money, at least temporarily. And it had a safe withdrawal rate going back to the 1920s of 4.2%, which is pretty respectable. Um, so that's the age 25. Let's go all the way to the right-hand corner. What about somebody who's seven years into retirement? Well, their portfolio has less risk, so you would expect it to have a lower return. And the nominal CAGR, the nominal compound annual growth rate was 8%, but the worst decade was actually a little bit better at 3.4%. Because you, when you diversify by adding in bonds, you get a higher degree of predictability in the outcome. And the biggest change is instead of a 48% drawdown that the young person's exposed to, the retiree was only exposed to a 17% uh, drawdown. So much, much less volatility year to year. The bad news is that the safe withdrawal rate for this portfolio was only 3.5% because it's very conservative. It's a 70% fixed income, 30% equities portfolio. And uh, so that's the target date fund ride. And uh, if you want to, you can look at the years in between, but the thing that motivated this from the start was really well, what would happen if you added a little bit of small cap value to it. But before we go there, I want to make sure <clears throat> that I understand. Uh, and and I'm looking now to the young person, the 25 or more sure. years. And by the way, Vanguard now has a 2070 target date fund. I didn't know that till this morning. Uh, and and uh, so that 9.8% return is based on holding that fund through the entire period, or is that only for the period uh, from, from the start to the point that you start adding more fixed income? It would be the return you would expect for the allocation you have in that box. Okay. So, so a, somebody who, who invests in a, uh, as a young person in a target date fund is actually going to, assuming they stay in that same fund, they're going to march across the chart as they get older. So that 9.8% just tells you what the historical compound annual growth rate has been for the allocation that they have when they're young. Okay. Uh, and, and just to kind of tell that story, the compound annual growth rate, as you march across the chart from 25 years 
to 20 years to 15 years. So every five-year increment going across goes from 9.8% to 9.6% to 9.4% to 9.2% to 9.0% to 8.7% at retirement and 8.0% seven years after retirement. So as you, if you stayed in that fund for a lifetime, as it goes through its glide path, the CAGR goes down. That 9.8% just represents the return for the asset allocation you have in those early years. And if you wanted to live in that box, again, same as the example I gave before, you could shift to a farther rate out target date fund every five years. Yeah. Right. And and so the other thing that's, that's uh, I guess, important uh, here is that you want to get all the money you can. I mean, you're young, you don't have much to, to put in there, but boy, I mean, you have that opportunity not only to make 9.8%, but to accumulate it early on so that it maximizes all along the way, whatever these returns might be. And and the reality is, and you pointed this out to me in a conversation recently, is that you can't just take an average of these returns and say, that's what I'm likely to get over a lifetime, because you may put in very little during the period of time that you're making 9.8 and put a whole bunch in during the period that you're that you're making more like eight. So the, the sequence of returns becomes a really, really big deal in how you actually perform. Yeah, and the, the, the later year, compound annual growth rates matter a lot more because that's typically where you have a lot more money. Right. And uh, so, what, I mean, one of the strategies we've talked about in the past is to shift some, you know, a higher percentage of your small cap value allocation into the early years. It doesn't make as big a difference as you might think because you don't have much money in those early years. And, and especially if you use the strategy where it ramps down to 0% in retirement, you get about the same benefit out of that strategy as you do by just having a constant 10% allocation to small cap value. And the 10% allocation to small cap value is a heck of a lot easier to do. You just set it up and let it ride. So, so let's, should we take a look at that next? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so so what happens then as we go down this chart is we add additional allocations to small cap value, and we we have a ten percent addition. And it's it's really a shift. So if you have ten percent in small cap value, you got ninety percent in the target date fund. Then we do twenty percent small cap value, eighty percent in the target date fund, thirty seventy, sixty forty, and all the way down to fifty fifty. And just for reference, there's 100% small cap value allocation at the bottom so that you can see what small cap value does on its own. So just adding 10% or shifting so that you're 90% in the target date fund and 10% in small cap value for that young investor takes them from a compound annual growth rate of 9.8% to 10.3%. It's a half a percent addition. In a lot of respects, this is like the fine tuning tables where you're adding 10% in bonds. And in some respects, what you're doing is you're compensating for the conservative nature of the target date fund by adding this riskier asset that goes up and down out of sync with the target date fund. And the good news is the worst 10 years also got better. So it went from 1.1% as the worst decade to 1.9%. And yes, there was a little bit higher drawdown, but it went from 48% to 49%, practically nothing. And the safe withdrawal rate stayed about the same. So for a young person, I think this looks almost like a no-brainer. And if you go across the chart to the right and you look at it from the perspective of a retiree, the retiree with the target date fund is looking at 8% as the compound growth uh, annual growth rate historically, and 3.4% is the worst. It took it from 8 to 8.7 by adding a 10% allocation to small cap value. And the worst decade went to 4.2. So both improved. 
And the safe withdrawal rate went from minus, uh, from 3.5% to 4.1. So it gets you over that magic four. And the worst drawdown, this is a rounding error. It does get a little bit worse. It's not a rounding error. It's just rounding. I'm rounding to single digit percentages. It stayed the same. It probably went from 16.8 to 17.3 or something. Um, but it's essentially 17% in both cases. So I, I think even for a retiree, this is a bit of a no-brainer. It's it's pretty easy to to see okay. how that would how that would make sense. So let me th- let me throw up another question here. That <clears throat> uh, again, this is this this is not to suggest these are the returns you're going to get, but 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 there are invest- investment decisions represented here that may be a little different than what might happen in real life. For example. You've assumed we start in that 25 years from retirement or more with 10%. And we are, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, there is no rebalancing going on here, correct? Well, actually, on this chart, the assumption is that everything is is annually rebalanced. Oh, annually. Um, so, okay. Oh, okay. so on this chart, the assumption is that you're making a lump sum investment. It's a fixed allocation. It's annually rebalanced. And you're basically living in one box until you're in the next box. And then you're living in that box. Um, but in the Two Fund for Life book, uh, what we analyzed is what happens if you leave that 10% unrebalanced. Just recognizing that a lot of people will have these in different accounts and it won't be easy to rebalance. Maybe there isn't small cap value in the 401k at work, right? And what that tends to do is increase the return and also increase the volatility a little bit because uh, you're letting your winners run. Um, you're not uh, clipping, clipping that. You're not managing the risk as continually as you would be. Uh, I think for most people, that's a great trade-off because essentially what's going to happen is your risk is going to go up as you watch one of your assets outperform. And uh, so down the road, that means it might underperform, but hopefully it's at a point you've developed some confidence in it and uh, you're willing to, and, and knowledge of it so that you're willing to ride out that downturn and wait for it to recover more dramatically than than the other asset that's also likely down at that point in time, but not as much. Yeah. And I, I have to just uh, throw this in. I have gotten a number of emails from people who have said, boy, it's been fun to be in small cap value recently, because as we all know, or those of us that have followed small cap value, it's underperformed for, for a period of time. And and uh, it has been on one of those terrors recently that uh, very common to the past. That's that, that's what it's done. And all of a yep. sudden it pops and we don't know where it comes from. But uh, anyway, I've enjoyed the emails. Thank you. <laughs> we could walk down this chart row by row, but I think, uh, you know, in the interest of just being illustrative for the podcast, it would be interesting to jump to the bottom and say, well, what about what about the person who dials it to 11 and says they're going to be crazy and be 50% in a target date fund and 50% in small cap value? And uh, first of all, in some respects, it's not that different from what you do, Paul. You're half in large, half in small, half in blend, half in value. That's close to what you get when you go 50-50 here. And when you're a retiree over on the far right hand side, you're taking a portfolio that is 70% in fixed income and dividing that by two. So that now you're almost a 60 40. You're basically a 65 35. So it's not a crazy allocation to equities for a retiree. Yeah. And what we see um, on for the young person is that instead of getting what the target date fund had as 9.8% CAGR, you're up to 12.1. Now, this is going back to 1970. Your mileage may vary. You may want to knock a point or two off of that, sure. but but it's dramatically higher, admittedly with more risk. Instead of a 48% drawdown, it had a 54% drawdown. Would you really notice that? I, I don't know. Um, 
And it had a worse safe withdrawal rate. Now, for a young person going from a 4.2 to a 3.6, you're not withdrawing money. It may not matter. But if we go over on the right-hand side and we look at that big jump from the target date fund to the 50-50, the safe withdrawal rate goes up a lot. It goes from 3.5% for the target date fund alone to 4.7%. And the worst drawdown for the 50-50 for that retiree who's seven years into retirement or more is only 39%. And the Kager, the, the, the nominal Kager going back to 1970 was 11.4%. The worst decade was 6.4. That is a, it's a pretty attractive box, actually. In fact, it's more attractive than the 100% target date fund for the young person. It's got a better Kager. The the target date fund uh, for a young person is a 9.8% Kager. The 50-50 for this retired fund is 11.4. The worst decade for the starting young person target date fund was 1.1. The worst decade for this 50-50 um, retiree is 6.4. Uh, so it, it's and the and the drawdowns only 39 compared to 48 for the target date fund for the young person. If somebody came to me and said, "I'm a young person and I'm going to go invest in the 2015 target date fund and do it 50-50 with small cap value." And I am willing to write out a decade or more of tracking error, essentially not looking like the S&P 500. I'd be hard pressed to say that's not a prudent lifetime solution. You could live in that box forever. Um, So very, very interesting things on this chart. Well, you know, the the challenge, uh, again, we're teachers, we're not advisors. And so... Uh, there are at least a thousand different combinations of assets that you're going to face as an advisor uh, that would make you uh, be supportive of that in some cases and not in others. I think the ideal way that that works is if somebody has been using the 50-50 strategy for 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years, which they will be able today with what they know, they will have that choice. And not only will they have gotten to more than likely a much bigger pot of gold, I mean, significantly bigger amount of money, they will have lived through some very difficult times. I'm very comfortable with that situation where somebody is coming into retirement and having responsibility for maintaining like the person who rolls over a pension fund uh, and has never actually managed the the money themselves. I get really nervous about them going with a 50-50 like this, uh, even even if most of it is in, in fixed income, only because they have not had a chance to experience uh, the nature of these more risky uh, strategies. And, and, and that's a hard one to, to guide people. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I have observed that myself in interactions with retirees in the last five years, people who have come into some money who were already living on a pension securely, but have come into some money and now are trying to figure out what to do with it from an investing standpoint. And one of the things I've concluded, I'd like to get your opinion on this too, but I I think they, in some respects, are actually very good candidates for advisors because they are so uncomfortable with the idea that they would know enough to be able to manage their own money But if there's somebody sitting across the table who's a professional, and yes, they're going to charge them 1% or whatever it is, they would trust the professional to put their money in equities. They would trust the professional to develop a diversified portfolio. And that change might easily pay the 1%. Well, I, I have to... To know more about the advisor, I mean, I mean that because sure. yeah, you want them to be a fiduciary, and well, and yeah. what if they don't expose to the investor the amount of risk that is that is built into whatever strategy 
that they apply. And, 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 the, and the reality is a lot of people, when they talk about the risk of the market, will say, can you take a 20% loss? Because that's what you're going to be exposed to. Yep. You're in an all equity, all equity portfolio. I've had people say that you're going to be exposed to a 20. No, you're not going to be exposed to 20. You're going to be exposed to 50. And if people, if you're not getting the truth from uh, from from these the managers, because there are there are a lot of people that I know, uh, in, in, including I. Uh, I, I, one of the biggest money managers in the country believed that people in retirement should have all of their money in equities. And yet I've talked to their clients and their clients ha do not have the risk of that kind of, of, of loss. So that even with an advisor, it's still a delicate matter, but better with an advisor than, than without, unless of course they learn to use all of our tables because that's what our tables are about to, to, to really set up what the best reality from the past might be. But I think this is, uh, this is an amazing table, Chris. And, and, uh, uh, when I get down to that 50, 50, uh, here's what I have a little bit of nervousness about. And, and you'll appreciate this because you're the one that likes us to look at, at the period from 1928 to, by the way, let me make sure I understand now. This information is from 1970 through 2022. I can read that in the fine print, right? Ex except for the safe withdrawal rate. The safe withdrawal rate calculation goes back to 1928. Okay, all right. But, but what it doesn't do then, it doesn't go back to look at the 1928 to 40 some where you had some terrible, terrible periods with even the S&P 500. Exactly. Yeah. And the, the worst decade, the worst 10 year compound annual growth rate would likely be worse than what's shown yeah. going back to 1970. Yeah. Okay. Well, worth noting. Well, I think this is terrific. And, 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 and so Again, take us down to that bottom right hand again. Now, I want to make sure I understand. In fact, let's look at the bottom three from or four from 20% in small cap value. You're in retirement and you've got 80% in a target date fund and 20% in small cap value. You're probably recommending annual rebalancing there, huh? Probably. Would you actually I'd I'd be quite happy with retirees who want to do nudge rebalancing. The difference isn't that big. And and by nudge rebalancing, I mean you look at if you're in a two fund portfolio, things are pretty simple. And if you're you know, you've only got two assets, and let's say that you've chosen to be uh 90 10. You just look at which one's bigger than it's supposed to be. So if small cap value is 11% and the target date fund is 89, you take your full 4% withdrawal that year out of the one that's 11. And you overshoot and you take it down to 7. Um, but if you don't want to rebalance and you just want to um, use your withdrawals to nudge things in the direction of a rebalance, I'd be fine with that. Or you could get slightly more complicated and take and, you know just use – the withdrawal to to take some out of target date fund and some out of small cap value. And if it's not enough to get you all the way there, just leave it and let it ride. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think that um, in my back testing, the differences aren't that great. And I don't want to make it too complicated for people. I know for us in retirement, we have some assets that have grown uh, more than they were supposed to. And it's really easy to sell those to fund our annual withdrawal because we have too much of it. And uh, it's a lot easier than, and more tax efficient in our case than mm -hmm. doing a rebalance. So that's, that's another reason if you have these in taxable accounts, it may make sense not to do the rebalancing because then you're not creating that added tax burden every year. So we have the ability with our lifetime investment calculator to be able to uh, determine what would happen if 
one had started accumulating money in, for example, 1970 and 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 at a certain age, and then they changed their 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 uh, uh, com- their asset allocation as they got older. I know we don't have this all built into that calculator, but how far off would it be if we simply took the S and P 500 as the equity? portion that would represent the target date fund and uh, um, and then a bond, some bonds to 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 look like the glide path of of a target date fund uh, and the small cap value. Could a person use those that combination to go through that investment lifetime investment calculator and try to build a what if uh, over a forty year period? Yeah, I'd have to talk to Craig and see. I, I think the challenge with the lifetime investment calculator is that uh, because it lets you model the cash flows coming and going and assumptions about your lifetime, uh, there's sort of an expectation that it would also let you model what's happening within a target date fund that is changing its allocation over time. And if you let somebody do that, then the next thing you want to be able to do is do it for more than just one history. Because as soon as you have an allocation that's changing over time, it gets suspect uh, to only analyze it for one time period because it might be a particularly lucky or unlucky time period for that sequence of returns versus that asset allocation. So Craig and I've talked about this in the past and, um, I think I think it would be difficult to add this in there, but I, you know, we should probably have that chat. See where see where it goes. Well, I will I will mention that if we look at all of the forty year periods since nineteen twenty eight, the average for the S and P five hundred has been eleven percent. The worst forty year period was eight point nine percent. And the best was 12.5%. So there is a, I mean, that's a lot, that's a huge difference in lifetime return. But it 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 sounds like during almost every 40-year period that a person might have gone through, they probably would have done just fine uh, with this kind of an approach. I, you know, I think there are two footnotes on this chart that we should mention for the podcast listeners. We've, yeah. we've already talked about a few of them, but uh, the, the one that I think is maybe counterintuitive unless people have followed our work over the years is that a young person really isn't going to see these worst case drawdowns that we've shown here for a lump sum investment because most of them are making relatively large contributions compared to the size of the balance in their account. And you've said that as an advisor, you would have young people who really didn't know how much the market was down because their regular contributions were masking that. And it's not all a mirage. There's actually some good news in there because when the market is down, those contributions are also buying more shares. So, The volatility that's reflected on the chart is a little bit uh, overly conservative for a young person. They're going to get a little smoother ride for the first five to 10 years that they're investing. The other thing that is worth mentioning is that these are all nominal returns and we don't really get to, our spending power doesn't go up on a nominal basis. It goes up on a real basis. Uh, the inflation that we experience makes those returns higher, but it makes the purchasing power weaker. So uh, somebody looking at this chart, thinking about how much they'll have to spend, should probably knock a few percentage points off. Uh, historically, for this period of time, it was about 4%, actually. Uh, 1970 to 2023, I think, is about 4%. Inflation is the average. It's interesting because in recent years, it's been more like two, but then maybe as much as nine, right? So you you never know what your ride is going to be like. But, um, but having said that, yeah, you know, just using the rule of 72, 
which is you take 72 and you divide it by an interest rate and it tells you how long it takes to double your money. Well, if if you have a 1% change in interest rate or a 1% interest rate, that's 72 years, which is rough, roughly an investor's lifetime. Uh, we're looking at differences on this chart going from the 0% allocation to small cap value to the 50% allocation to small cap value of, let's see, what is it? 2%-ish. That means a doubling about once every 36 years. Mm -hmm. So it's reasonable to think that these strategies across a lifetime could double, triple, or even more multiply the amount of real spending power that you have if you can earn that return by tolerating the different ride and sticking with it. And I think that's, that's the most powerful story to tell for a young person is that, you know, choice number one, are you going to invest 10 to 20% of your money in a target date fund? Because that choice could double your lifetime spending power. Choice number two, are you going to shift some of that investment into small cap value and stick with it with discipline? And that choice could double again, your lifetime spending power. Those are powerful lessons. And somebody who is a young person is sitting next to somebody else who's not going to make that decision. Their lives are going to be dramatically different in the amount of wealth that they experience. And, and I, I hope that if nothing else, people, people get that. You know, the, uh, one of the most effective presentations I think I've ever made uh, is the piece we talk about uh, understanding the math of investing. Mm -hmm. And when I look at your table here, uh, it reminds me that most of that math of investing focus on an extra half of 1% and what that did in your life. Yep. And it assumed a person putting away $6,000 a year for 40 years and uh, making 8% versus 85 and then retiring at the end of 40 years and for 30 years, taking out 4% a year and in one investment making 6% and the other 6.5%. So over a lifetime, it was an extra half of 1%. And even with only $6,000, no increase, and no adjustment for inflation or anything, but just that 6,000 a year over that 40 years uh, added about a million and a half dollars to a lifetime of, of spending and leaving others uh, additional money. So when I look at between the zero small cap value and the 100% target date fund and the 10% in small cap value and the 90% target date fund, and I see the difference in return is basically a half of 1%. I'm almost begging young people to, to, if they did nothing else besides the target date fund, just add that 10%, that it will be something that will be a life changer. It may not be a huge life changer for you, maybe it'll be for your heirs, but it is going to change some lives. And I think uh, create an experience that will impact the rest of your portfolio eventually over a lifetime. So, Chris, I think it, you've done it again. Uh, I, I'm I'm calling this a triple headed for home. This is a great piece. <laughs> and uh, and and I, is there anything you want to close with uh, that we need to address? Here? Oh, I just I I you know I wish. Uh, as a teacher, I wish I could have seen the end from the beginning. Uh, you know, it's the longer you teach something, I think the more you get to know and understand it. And I thank our listeners for living with us through the experience of discovering, researching, describing these approaches, because I think we do get better at it over time. But that means those of them who've been with us for three years, four years watching it, uh, may have been confused or befuddled along the way because we weren't as good at it in the early years. But uh, I, I I think we're getting there. I, I think it's getting sure. to be a cleaner, simpler story, hopefully one that is easier to tell and pass on to friends. 
that's that's the purpose of what we're doing here and i appreciate it very much and uh we will by the way you know you're going to get some questions on this on this table i'm oh, of course I'm excited to see those questions because we're going to we're going to do a future podcast where we get caught up on questions on the two funds for life strategy and i think if we have time maybe even throw in a little best in class uh, etf recommendation so uh, I'd love to do that before the end of the year. So thanks for your fine work, Chris. And thanks to all of you who uh, have taken the time to uh, spend with us. And I do hope it is a life changer for all of you. Thanks.